the sort of evidence that accrues um, by following large numbers of people over time and monitoring their behaviours and then waiting to see what happens to their health several years later. Now the evidence in the US Surgeon General's report summarised looks something like this. On this slide we've got cardiovascular disease mortality and on this side, in this axis, levels of physical activity. One means people doing nothing and these over here would be athletes and people doing lots of physical activity. And you can see that moving from none to lots, there's a trend downwards in cardiovascular disease mortality and the report told us that this level around here seemed to be the place where you would get the best the most benefit for the least effort, because after this, things kind of leveled off a bit in some of these studies. And this level was equivalent to about 30 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity on most days each week. So we were told to do that, and most of us read the report and tried to start to get people in populations around the world doing this. Now, as I said, most of that evidence was based on cohorts of men, and since that time there has been a lot of evidence from large cohorts of women, most notably the US Nurses Study, which has about 76,000 women. They've been following them now since about 1976. And the data looks much the same. These are outcomes of um, coronary heart disease or stroke or cardiovascular disease in five different studies, and you see the same thing here. But this time on this axis, this is walking because women in middle age tend not to play sport, but they do a lot of walking. And the evidence is exactly the same. You see that compared with those who are doing no walking, those who are doing lots of walking have much reduced risk of heart disease or stroke or cardiovascular disease. Trending downwards and meeting the Surgeon General's guidelines would be in this area here. And these data tell us that as little as one hour a week can have quite significant health benefits. Most of you would be aware of that, those data. You know about the health benefits of cardiovascular disease and of diabetes and maybe a little bit about cancer. But something that's been appearing in the literature in the last few years is this issue of physical activity and arthritis. Now I'm not sure, but I think there's a few former Olympians in the audience and I wouldn't mind betting that some of you are starting to suffer from arthritis. And this is because participation in physical activity is not always protective against arthritis, especially if you've had an injury. But in our study of, of women in Australia, this is looking at women who are in their 70s. And we find that, um, you can see on this slide, but again it's relative risk of developing arthritis. And as we move through levels of physical activity, moving from none, very low, low, moderate levels, this means 30 minutes a day, the risk of developing arthritis in your 70s goes down. Now, those of you that are familiar with these bars, this means this is a confidence bar, and if the bars don't cross this purple line, this means this is a significant effect. So women in their 70s who are meeting the guidelines are less likely to develop arthritis if they get to their 70s without having had arthritis. But if they do more activity, and they're not doing huge amounts more, it goes up again. And I would venture to say that if these were younger women, um, doing lots of activity might actually bring the, um, lessen the risk a lot. But for women who are walking only, and many women of course only walk, we get this beautiful dose response trend downwards. So the more walking you do, the less likely you are to develop arthritis. And that's really good news, because with an aging population, the prevalence of arthritis now, certainly in Australia, is about 8%, which is quite high and probably going to increase with the ageing population. It's a very painful condition. So doing half an hour again or an hour a day of walking can protect against arthritis. The other interesting health condition that's come to light in the last few years is this relationship between physical activity and cognitive functioning, and of course then would eventually with dementia. This is a study from Italy which followed 749 men and women who were aged 65 and over, just for four years. And during the four years there were 86 cases of incident dementia. They divided the participants into two groups. This group are walking, which is about an hour a week, and this group are doing less. And compared with this group, the group who were walking had a 0.36 risk of developing um, dementia. And there's lots of other studies around the world that show that physical activity 
is probably protective against cognitive decline. And I guess the mechanism, if you think about it, would be much the same as it is in heart disease. If you're exercising, there's circulatory benefits, and those benefits, of course, don't only affect the heart. They also affect the brain and all the other tissues and organs of the body. So keeping the blood pumping around, keeping those capillaries open, not letting them get clogged up with fat, is probably beneficial in lots and lots of ways. Not only the ones that are in the US Surgeon General's report, which certainly didn't include um, any evidence of that dementia. So last year, at the end of last year in the US, there were updated recommendations about physical activity, trying to bring in some of these new health findings. So in late last year and then just, uh, just last month, the US government published new guidelines for physical activity, which essentially say the same thing. They reinforce the message, two and a half hours of moderate aerobic physical activity each, each week, or five lots of 30 minutes a day, or half of that amount of vigorous physical activity each week, or a combination of the two, will give you substantial health benefits. It doesn't have to be sport, it can be walking, water aerobics, or relaxing, gardening, any activity that people like to do. But added this time, which wasn't in the guidelines last time, is that there should be strength and endurance training as well on a minimum of two days each week. So we see there can be health benefits from fairly moderate levels of physical activity, but if you are still participating in sport in middle age and old age, the benefits will likely be greater in most areas, but perhaps not in relation to osteoarthritis. Also in the updated recommendations, there's an interesting point made about the prevention of unhealthy weight gain. Now we saw yesterday those dramatic pictures of obese children. However, if we look around the world at the levels of obesity, and this is really um, in developed countries that I'm talking about, the levels of obesity in children are nowhere near the levels of obesity in the mid-age population. For example, in Australia, 5% of children are obese, but 75% of middle-aged men are overweight or obese. We have a huge problem with overweight and obesity in Australia. And that's because if the problem starts with young adults and people get generally just a little bit fatter each year until in middle age we've got this time bomb explosion of overweight and obesity. And we're not here at this conference to talk about obesity, we're talking about sport. But sport, of course, is going to be integral in preventing weight gain, which eventually leads to obesity. Now, in this new report from the US last year and again this year, they point out that if we're going to prevent unhealthy weight gain, we may need to do more than 30 minutes a day, which is something that a lot of us have suspected for a long time. And they're saying now that one hour of physical activity each day will be necessary to prevent weight gain. So what do we know about weight gain and physical activity in adults? And the answer is actually very little. There are very few data sets which have followed changes in weight over time. So I want to show you some results from the Australian Longitudinal Study of Women's Health. It is about Australians and it is about women, but I think this is fairly typical of what's happening in developed countries and I would venture to suggest probably in some developing countries as well. So our study on women's health began in 1996. We had 40,000 women. They're in three age groups and they're from all over Australia where these dots are. Nobody here because this is desert and nobody here because nobody lives there. But all these other towns and villages and cities around the edge and down here in Tasmania are represented. We have three groups. The young women were 18 to 23, the mid-age 45 to 50, and the older 70 to 75 when we began in 1996. And we've been surveying these women on this three-year rotating basis. So we're up to the fifth survey of each group. And one of the most interesting things we've found so far is the weight gain issue. So in the young women, this is the weight in 1996, and this is the weight of the same women 10 years later. These are women in their 20s. These are women who were 45, and this is their, their weight now when they were 53. And you can see, not surprisingly, they're gaining weight. Now, of course, if these young women continue to gain weight through to middle age, they're going to end up being overweight and obese. 
They've been gaining 628 grams per year. The mid-age group have been gaining 423 grams per year. And so we work out that if this continues, by the time these young women are 45, which is where these women started, they'll be up here, which will be seven kilograms heavier than the previous generation of women. Now, does that matter? We hear people say, we really shouldn't be focusing on weight gain. But if we look at the relationship between BMI, which is the surrogate for weight along here, given that height doesn't change very much, at least until you get to about 70, and this is the risk of diabetes, we see there's an exponential increase. So if your BMI, healthy weight, is between 22 and 25, you see the risk of diabetes is still increasing a little bit, but once you get to a BMI of 25, it starts to increase exponentially. So in our young women in 1996, the average BMI was 22 down here, and 10 years later, it was 25, which is here. So their risk has increased, probably from 2.2 to 5.5. Now in another 10 years, it's going to be here. This is going to mean a lot of health problems for Australian women in the next 10 years. And these are not, these are not old women, these are middle-aged women. And the same with the mid-age group, they've moved from here to here already. So 10 times